and welcome to Bite Sized Audio on YouTube. I'm Simon Stanhope, actor, audiobook narrator, and curator of this channel. On the channel, you can hear my narrations, more than a hundred to date and more to come, of classic short stories, mostly from the Victorian and Edwardian eras, including vintage ghost stories, detective stories, and other classic tales of mystery and suspense. To accompany the narrations, I've put a short profile of the authors in the video description, as well as some general background notes on the stories for those who'd like to know more. If you enjoy this content, please hit subscribe, like, share, leave a comment if you'd like to, and thank you for listening. The Ghost's Summons by Ada Buisson Wanted, sir, a patient. It was in the early days of my professional career, when patients were scarce and fees scarcer, and though I was in the act of sitting down to my chop and had promised myself a glass of steaming punch afterwards in honour of the Christmas season, I hurried instantly into my surgery. I entered briskly, but no sooner did I catch sight of the figure standing leaning against the counter than I started back with a strange feeling of horror, which for the life of me I could not comprehend. Never shall I forget the ghastliness of that face, the white horror stamped upon every feature, the agony which seemed to sink the very eyes beneath the contracted brows. It was awful to me to behold— accustomed as I was to scenes of terror. "'You seek advice?' I began, with some hesitation. "'No, I am not ill.' "'You require, then—' "'Hush!' he interrupted, approaching more nearly, and dropping his already low murmur to a mere whisper. "'I believe you are not rich. Would you be willing to earn a thousand pounds?' "'A thousand pounds! His words seemed to burn my very ears. "'I should be thankful if I could do so honestly,' I replied, with dignity. "'What is the service required of me?' "'A peculiar look of intense horror passed over the white face before me, "'but the blue-black lips answered firmly, "'To attend a deathbed.' A thousand pounds to attend a deathbed? Where am I to go, then? Whose is it? Mine. The voice in which this was said sounded so hollow and distant that involuntarily I shrank back. Yours? What nonsense! You are not a dying man. You are pale, but you appear perfectly healthy. You— Hush! he interrupted. I know all this. You cannot be more convinced of my physical health than I am myself. Yet I know that before the clock tolls the first hour after midnight, I shall be a dead man. But— He shuddered slightly, but stretching out his hand commandingly, motioned me to be silent. I am but too well informed of what I affirm— he said quietly. I have received a mysterious summons from the dead. No mortal aid can avail me. I am as doomed as the wretch on whom the judge has passed sentence. I do not come either to seek your advice or to argue the matter with you, but simply to buy your services. I offer you a thousand pounds to pass the night in my chamber— and witness the scene which takes place. The sum may appear to you extravagant, but I have no further need to count the cost of any gratification, and the spectacle you will have to witness is no common sight of horror. 
The words, strange as they were, were spoken calmly enough, but as the last sentence dropped slowly from the livid lips, an expression of such wild horror again passed over the stranger's face that, in spite of the immense fee, I hesitated to answer. "'You fear to trust the promise of a dead man. See here, and be convinced,' he exclaimed eagerly, and the next instant, on the counter between us, lay a parchment document, and following the indication of that white, muscular hand, I read the words, "'And to Mr. Frederick Keed, of 14 High Street, Alton, I bequeath the sum of one thousand pounds for certain services rendered to me. I have had that will drawn up within the last twenty-four hours, and I signed it an hour ago in the presence of competent witnesses. I am prepared, you see. Now, do you accept my offer or not? My answer was to walk across the room and take down my hat and then lock the door of the surgery, communicating with the house. It was a dark, icy-cold night, and somehow the courage and determination which the sight of my own name, in connection with a thousand pounds, had given me, flagged considerably, as I found myself hurried along through the silent darkness by a man whose deathbed I was about to attend. He was grimly silent, but as his hand touched mine, in spite of the frost, it felt like a burning coal. On we went, tramp, tramp, through the snow, on, on, till even I grew weary, and at length on my appalled ear struck the chimes of a church clock, whilst close at hand I distinguished the snowy hillocks of a churchyard. Heavens! Was this awful scene, of which I was to be the witness, to take place veritably amongst the dead? Eleven, groaned the doomed man. Gracious God, but two hours more, and that ghostly messenger will bring the summons. Come, come, for mercy's sake, let us hasten. There was but a short road, separating us now from a wall which surrounded a large mansion, and along this we hastened until we reached a small door. Passing through this, in a few minutes we were stealthily ascending the private staircase to a splendidly furnished apartment, which left no doubt of the wealth of its owner. All was intensely silent, however, through the house, and about this room in particular there was a stillness that, as I gazed around, struck me as almost ghastly. My companion glanced at the clock on the mantel-shelf, and sank into a large chair by the side of the fire with a shudder. "'Only an hour and a half longer,' he muttered. "'Great heaven! I thought I had more fortitude. This horror unmans me!' Then, in a fiercer tone, and clutching my arm, he added, "'Ha! You mock me! You think me mad!' but wait till you see, wait till you see. I put my hand on his wrist, for there was now a fever in his sunken eyes, which checked the superstitious chill which had been gathering over me, and made me hope that, after all, my first suspicion was correct, and that my patient was but the victim of some fearful hallucination. "'Mock you,' I answered soothingly, "'far from it,' I sympathize intensely with you, and would do much to aid you. You require sleep. Lie down, and leave me to watch. He groaned, but rose, and began throwing off his clothes, and, watching my opportunity, I slipped a sleeping powder, which I had managed to put in my pocket before leaving the surgery, into the tumbler of claret that stood beside him. The more I saw— the more I felt convinced that it was the nervous system of my patient which required my attention, and it was with sincere satisfaction I saw him drink the wine, and then stretch himself on the luxurious bed. Ha! thought I, as the clock struck twelve, and instead of a groan, 
The deep breathing of the sleeper sounded through the room. "'You won't receive any summons to-night, and I may make myself comfortable.' Noiselessly, therefore, I replenished the fire, poured myself out a large glass of wine, and, drawing the curtain so that the firelight should not disturb the sleeper, I put myself in a position to follow his example. How long I slept, I know not, but suddenly I aroused with a start, and as ghostly a thrill of horror as ever I remember to have felt in my life. Something, what I knew not, seemed near, something nameless, but unutterably awful. I gazed round. The fire emitted a faint blue glow, just sufficient to enable me to see that the room was exactly the same as when I fell asleep, but that the long hand of the clock wanted but five minutes of the mysterious hour which was to be the death moment of the summoned man. Was there anything in it, then? Any truth in the strange story he had told? The silence was intense. I could not even hear a breath from the bed, and I was about to rise and approach, when again that awful horror seized me, and at the same moment my eye fell upon the mirror opposite the door, and I saw, great heaven, that awful shape, that ghastly mockery of what had been humanity. Was it really a messenger from the buried, quiet dead? It stood there, in visible death-clothes, but the awful face was ghastly with corruption, and the sunken eyes gleamed forth a green, glassy glare, which seemed a veritable blast from the infernal fires below. To move or utter a sound in that hideous presence was impossible, and like a statue I sat and saw that horrid shape move slowly towards the bed. What was the awful scene enacted there? I know not. I heard nothing, except a low, stifled, agonized groan, and I saw the shadow of that ghastly messenger bending over the bed. Whether it was some dreadful but wordless sentence its breathless lips conveyed as it stood there, I know not, but for an instant the shadow of a claw-like hand, from which the third finger was missing, appeared extended over the doomed man's head. And then, as the clock struck one clear silvery stroke, it fell, and a wild shriek rang through the room, a death shriek. I am not given to fainting, but I certainly confess that the next ten minutes of my existence was a cold blank, and even when I did manage to stagger to my feet, I gazed round, vainly endeavouring to understand the chilly horror which still possessed me. Thank God, the room was rid of that awful presence. I saw that. So, gulping down some wine, I lighted a wax taper, and staggered towards the bed. Ah, how I prayed that, after all, I might have been dreaming, and that my own excited imagination had but conjured up some hideous memory of the dissecting-room. But one glance was sufficient to answer that. No, the summons had indeed been given and answered. I flashed the light over the dead face swollen, convulsed still with the death-agony. But suddenly I shrank back. Even as I gazed, the expression of the face seemed to change. The blackness faded into a deathly whiteness. The convulsed features relaxed, and, even as if the victim of that dreadful apparition still lived, a sad, solemn smile stole over the pale lips. I was intensely horrified, but still I retained sufficient self-consciousness 
to be struck professionally by such a phenomenon. Surely there was something more than supernatural agency in all this. Again I scrutinized the dead face, and even the throat and chest, but with the exception of a tiny pimple on one temple beneath a cluster of hair, not a mark appeared. To look at the corpse, one would have believed that this man had indeed died by the visitation of God, peacefully, whilst sleeping. How long I stood there I know not, but time enough to gather my scattered senses, and to reflect that, all things considered, my own position would be very unpleasant if I was found thus unexpectedly in the room of the mysteriously dead man. So, as noiselessly as I could, I made my way out of the house. No one met me on the private staircase. The little door opening into the road was easily unfastened, and thankful indeed was I to feel again the fresh wintry air as I hurried along that road by the churchyard. There was a magnificent funeral soon in that church, and it was said that the young widow of the buried man was inconsolable. And then rumours got abroad of a horrible apparition which had been seen on the night of the death, and it was whispered the young widow was terrified and insisted upon leaving her splendid mansion. I was too mystified with the whole affair to risk my reputation by saying what I knew, and I should have allowed my share in it to remain for ever buried in oblivion, had I not suddenly heard that the widow, objecting to many of the legacies in the last will of her husband, intended to dispute it on the score of insanity, and then there gradually arose the rumour of his belief in having received a mysterious summons. On this I went to the lawyer, and sent a message to the lady, that, as the last person who had attended her husband, I undertook to prove his sanity, and I besought her to grant me an interview, in which I would relate as strange and horrible a story as ear had ever heard. The same evening I received an invitation to go to the mansion. I was ushered immediately into a splendid room, and there, standing before the fire, was the most dazzlingly beautiful young creature I had ever seen. She was very small, but exquisitely made. Had it not been for the dignity of her carriage, I should have believed her a mere child. With a stately bow she advanced, but did not speak. "'I come on a strange and painful errand,' I began, and then I started, for I happened to glance full into her eyes, and from them down to the small right hand grasping the chair. The wedding ring was on that hand. I conclude you are the Mr. Keed, who requested permission to tell me some absurd ghost story, and whom my late husband mentions here. And as she spoke, she stretched out her left hand towards something, but what I knew not, for my eyes were fixed on that hand. Horror! White and delicate it might be, but it was shaped like a claw and the third finger was missing. One sentence was enough after that. Madam, all I can tell you is that the ghost who summoned your husband was marked by a singular deformity. The third finger of the left hand was missing, I said sternly, and the next instant I had left that beautiful, sinful presence. That will was never disputed. The next morning, too, I received a cheque for a thousand pounds, and the next news I heard of the widow was that she had herself seen that awful apparition, and had left the mansion immediately.
You've been listening to a bite-sized audiobook, read by me, Simon Stanhope. If you'd like to help me to keep producing new content, you can find links in the video description to my Patreon page, or to buy me a coffee. Another way to support me is through my Bandcamp page, bitesizedaudio.bandcamp.com, where you can hear my narrations of many more classic short stories, and you can also purchase and download them to keep. This recording is copyright Bitesized Audio 2023. Thank you for listening.